come to work like this for nine years. I swear, just like this every morning. How you doing? Good to see you. You doing okay? Hi there. How you doing today? And there was this wake of murmuring behind me. <laughs> Sounded something like this. I hate him. <laughs> now what did they hate about me? Come on, what they hate? I was happy. God forbid we have a happy person in our midst. Now how many of you know once you've identified the happy person, what's the second objective? <laughs> Kill the happy person. <laughs> Isn't it true? By the way, who are the happy people in the room? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Real hot. Be proud, happy people. Look at the happy people. No, God bless you. you got to know about happy, happy people. people. Number one, we're not always happy. But you don't have to know that. Right? How many know some people who are never, never happy? You're the first to know. That's right. I call them human ticks. They're the kind of people that suck the life out of you. You know what I'm talking about? They're the kind of people that light up a room just by leaving it. And I have a little advice for you if you're one of those people. My friend Robert Henry used to say this, great advice. If you're one of those people always telling your problems to people, he'd say this, 80% of the people you tell your problems to really don't care. And the other 20% are glad you've got them. Okay, I mean... They're, they're juiced you're having a bad day, you know what I'm saying? So shut your pie hole. We're not interested in hearing your complaints. Second thing you got to know about happy people, real quickly. We're not happy to make other people happy. Please hear that. It, it, you're not that important. I mean, you're not, it's not about you. Let me tell you why we're happy. You want to know? Because it's the only way we can navigate our way through the cesspool of thumb-sucking losers we got to see all day. Can I get an amen from the happy people? Hallelujah from the happy people. You betcha. The that he brought to cooking has created a frenzy of interest in cooking and food. I personally blame him for the obesity problem in America. You know exactly who I'm talking about. And here's what he would do during his show. At least once during every show, Emeril Lagasse takes the dish, puts it together, heats it up, stirs it up, and then watch, he does this special thing. He reaches into this tiny little bowl, and he pulls out a little pinch. Remember, what, he, what is this stuff? You know what it's called? Essence, exactly. That's why his show's called The Essence of Emeril. He takes this essence, watch this, and he takes it and he throws it into the pan, and he says what? Bam! Bam! Now watch this. When that stuff hits the pan, watch me, it fundamentally changes the nature of that dish. Are, are you with me? And everybody in the audience is just wiping the drool. <laughs> now here's my point. Everybody in this room has essence. It's the essence of you. And nobody does it like you. It's your unique gift to the world. And here's what I learned. Most of us gave up on that a long time ago. And I'm here to re-inspire it again. It's inside of you. And every morning you wake up and you roll out of bed, if you're really honest about it, it's there. But you're just either ignoring it or you're serving it. And I'm here to challenge you because here's one thing I know. I know that one person with passion is better than 40 people merely interested. How many know some people that are just merely interested? Who's sitting beside some of those people? No, I'm just, I'm just kidding you on that, don't <laughs> Got a question. Can you get more work done with one person who's passionate than 40 people who are simply interested? You bet. And listen, I'm just here to challenge you today, leaders. We can no longer be simply interested. <laughs> it's no longer a business option. <laughs> we have to step up. And we have to get to a different level of leading people, and it comes through this, this concept of passion. Now, I hate definitions, but, but here's one I think it's valuable for our discussion. According to Merriam-Webster, passion is an intense driving or overmastering feeling or conviction. A strong desire for or devotion to some activity, object, or concept. Now, here it is. It's an emotion that is deeply stirring and ungovernable. Now, let me ask this question. 
When was the last time you rolled into work and thought to yourself, today, I'm going to do something ungovernable. <laughs> today, I am going to do something deeply stirring. I'm going to do something, here, watch this, that I can't help but do. I mean, if I show up, I've got to do it. I, because that's just who I am from the time I was a little kid, from everybody around me. What, what do you think is one particular thing everybody said to me? Idea? I'm a speaker. Shut up. <laughs> All my life, Chip, shut up. You need to shut up. Shut your mouth. I go to school, bring home my first report card. What did it say? Talks in class. My mother sat me down. She said, Chip, your teacher agrees with me. Shut up. You need to shut your mouth. We'd be on vacation, right? My dad would turn around in his seat. Chip, you need to shut up. I'm going to pull this car over right now. You need to shut your mouth. I thought something was fundamentally wrong with me. I swear, here's what would happen. Something would happen on this planet, and I felt obligated to comment on it. And every time I did, I would get this stop. Shut up. Who finds it at least a little bit ironic that the very thing my parents wanted to beat out of me, I'm now using to help pay for their vacation. <laughs> Experts around you don't always know what's best. Even if it's in the best intention, they don't always recognize, are you with me, the things that are part of your who-ness. That's a word Dr. Seuss and I put together. Your who-ness. Your who-ness is the essence of you, the part of you you can't help, that's ungovernable, deeply stirring. And here's the question, how in touch with that are you? And how often do you honor it? Because ultimately, that's what people show up to watch you do. In 1995, September 6th, I was fortunate enough to be diagnosed with cancer. When was the last time you heard those words put in the same sentence? Fortunate enough so to be I diagnosed. Found out I was diagnosed with cancer. I went home and I wrote at the top of the page, and this will be a good exercise for you if you'd like to explore, but I wrote this. My purpose in life is dot, dot, dot. See, because I know something. I know that everybody in this room was brought here for a purpose, a divine purpose purpose. You're no accident. You were put here to do something, watch this, unique and different from everybody else on the planet. And I'm not going to ask you if you know what that is. But here's one thing I do know. If you don't know what that is, you're waking up every morning unconsciously trying to figure it out. And so I wrote this, my purpose in life is dot, dot, dot. And for three and a half days, I tried to fill in that blank and nothing jumped off the page. I mean, nothing stirring, nothing ungovernable, nothing really moving me until the middle of the fourth day. And about 1.30 in the afternoon, I wrote this on the page, and when I did, tears filled my eyes. Joy began to flood over me like I've never experienced it before, and I celebrated one of the most powerful moments of my life because there's two great days in the life of a man. The day he was born, and the day he discovers why. And I wrote on the page, and this won't rock your world, it's no big deal to you, but it has significantly changed every aspect of my who-ness. And I wrote this on the page. My purpose in life is to encourage and inspire others to seek, discover, and explore their ultimate potential. That's what I do. Excuse me. Did I say that's what I do? I apologize. That's who I am. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you solve that puzzle, you can't help but live life at a different is this. level. Are you showing up? in a way that's passionate and purposeful about what you do so that people around you can't help but say, wow, do that again.
Because it's possible if you live with a sense of significance. And, and, and notice I'm not using the word importance. I don't want to be important. I'm just a nobody that wants to be everything to somebody. Right? And I hope that somebody's in the today. world, right? Sit by somebody. What's the first question they ask me? Come on, first question. What do you do? I look at them, I go, I am a professional speaker. And you can see all the blood drain from their face. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They're like, oh my God, I'm on a plane for two and a half hours with a professional talker. <laughs> no, that is not what I say. I do not say that. That's what a typical person would say. I look at them, they say, what do you do? I go, I encourage and inspire others, seek, discover, explore their ultimate potential. And they look at me, and there's two responses I get. Ready? First one, have a nice flight. <laughs> right? I mean, they're not interested. They're thinking, what kind of a fruitcake is sitting next to me? <laughs> because, listen to me, I'm not looking for validation. Are, are you with me? I don't need it. Why do I need this guy, a stranger, for two and a half hours to validate me? And why does he need me to validate him? So I'm sitting there, I go, this is who I am. And he either says, I don't want to hear it, or he'll ask this question. It happens occasionally. They'll say, how do you do that? <laughs> And I say, here's how I do it. I travel around the world and I encourage people. I speak to people and I tell them how to find their better self. You have a better self, don't you? <laughs> and they all say, well, ah, probably, yeah. I talk about how to have a better life, how to have a, a, a happier life, to feel better about themselves. And I say, you're, you're happy about your life, aren't you? Now, listen to how about 90% of the people respond to that question. Sounds something like this. My life sucks. Now, just, just hang in there a minute. Just, just hold on. Think for a minute how lucky this person is. Are you ahead of me? Watch it. They are sitting beside a person whose purpose it is. <laughs> it's to encourage, inspire others, seek, discover, support their ultimate potential. Got a question. Has this person whose life sucks hit the airline ticket jackpot? <laughs> I mean, could they, got a question. Could they have a better seat on that plane? Oh, no. And here's, here's my point. It has nothing to do with my importance. It has to do with what? The fact that I know why I'm there. And usually we end up talking. They'll give me a business card. We keep in touch. And I cannot tell you the countless number of times that someone has called or emailed me and said, Chip, thank you. Thank you for spending that time with me. Now watch this. That plane's flying at 35,000 feet. But I'm going about 50. Why? Because I'm important? No. But listen, I am incredibly significant. And so are you. Do you have any idea how significant you are? I mean, can you really get your head around that? I mean, you walk past people all day long, and you have no idea. They could be going through a divorce, or their kids are on crack. Or I'm serious. I mean, this is tough. And you're in a position of leadership. Now watch me. Sometimes just the glance across the room, sometimes the turned up corners of your mouth in a smile, listen to me, can light up a life. And do you walk around with a sense of awareness of that? Or you just cluelessly walk through the hallway hoping to get from point A to point B? My point is simply this. You're missing divine moments all the way along your journey. I put it in park, and my door flew open, and I heard, heard these words, welcome to the Ritz Carlton. Big hand was extended to me. He said, my name is Jonathan, may I ask yours? I said, yes, I'm, I'm Chip Madeira. He says, Mr. Madeira, will you be spending the weekend with us? I said, yes, I will. He said, Mr. Madeira, we hope that this will be one of the best weekends of your entire life. And I said, Jonathan, you're on your way. <laughs> I mean, it's looking pretty good right now. He said, can I get your bags? And I said, sure. We popped the trunk, and he starts taking my bags out, and we're having conversation. He's getting to know me, and he walks me inside, and he introduces me to Betty. Betty's my registrar, and she beams with a smile of greeting. She's so thankful that I showed up, and she expedites my registration with all kinds of courtesies and niceties. I mean, she just exploded with joy. And I, it was just wonderful experience to check in that quick and move through the system. And she introduced me to Tony. Tony was my bellman. Now, Tony is walking me across this beautiful 
marble cladded lobby and Tony points out he says Mr. Madeira that is our gift shop over there and he said if you're on campus this weekend and you're looking for a particular item he said would you and you cannot find it he said would you please bring that item to our staff's attention and we'll do anything we possibly can to get it for you and I couldn't help it I it, it happened to me for the first time that weekend and it started down here in my belly and I, I have no idea how this happened but it started bubbling up out, out of me right over my esophagus and I, I couldn't help it I couldn't it was it was ungovernable it was deeply stirring and I looked at Tony and I go wow <laughs> we walked a little further <laughs> we got down to the restaurant and he said mr. Madeira he said, that's our five-star restaurant. He said, the chef is incredible. He said, the food is amazing. The service will knock your socks off. He said, would you like to make a reservation? I said, oh, you bet. I heard all about it all over the state of Florida. It's a wonderful place to eat. He says, uh, when would you like that? I said, oh, late, 9, 9.30. He said, we'll do what we can to set that up for you, and I'll give you a call later on, Mr. Madera. So we walk up to these elevators, and flanking, the elevators are flanking this beautiful ashtray slash trash can and it is beautiful it is gorgeous I mean it's brass and it's marble and it's got this beautiful sand on the top and in the sand is pressed the symbol of a lion the symbol of the Ritz Carlton and I mean it was just gorgeous and I'm looking at this trash can I'm admiring this trash can and this guy comes up from behind me and takes the last puff off his cigarette and sticks it in the forehead of the lion and kind of messes up the sand now, I did not look at my watch. Jill, I had no idea. I didn't, don't know how, many, how much time had passed, but it couldn't have been more than three to five seconds. And from behind this bush, <laughs> this guy comes out. He grabs his cigarette butt out of the thing, puts it in a pouch, grabs this thing, presses it into the sand, and then disappears. I didn't see him all weekend. And I stood there by that ashtray and I said to myself, wow, wow, that's amazing. We went up to the room, Tony put my bags in the room. Mr. Madeira, if there's anything we can get you to do for you this weekend, don't hesitate to call, it be our pleasure to serve you. He closed the door behind me. Have, have you ever been anywhere where you felt like you didn't belong? Man, this was awesome. I mean, the room was just marble and brass and leather and I was just smelling everything. And I was putting my clothes away in these cedar-lined armoire. I mean, I was just feeling the experience. And about 15 minutes later, I heard a knock at the door. I went to the door. It was Tony. This time, Tony had a plate in his hand with chocolate chip cookies the size of my head. <laughs> he handed me the plate with a note. He said, Mr. Madeira, this, this is just a gift for you. We feel so honored that you selected us for the weekend. If there's anything we can get you, please don't hesitate to call us. It would be our pleasure. Serbia. I opened the, the note. It was from the president of the Ritz-Carlton thanking me for my stay. And I said, wow. I went down to dinner that night. After walking around the campus, I went down to dinner, and it was just as Tony said. I had the chef's wine tasting menu. You ever have a dinner like that? Seven courses, each interrupted by a taste of wine. <laughs> to clear the palate. It was amazing. I mean, it was off the chain. And I'm sitting there the whole night, and it, just one thing after another was happening. And I got to tell you what, they had ninjas for everything in that restaurant. <laughs> they had napkin ninjas, knife ninjas, fork ninjas, bread ninjas, butter ninjas. I swear, you put your bread knife down beside your bread plate and out of nowhere. I, don't want to worry about it. I mean, it was gone. <laughs> and all weekend, I'm walking around this campus going, wow. <laughs> Wow! Wow! And then I got my bill. Wow! <laughs> you say, Chip, what's the analogy? Well, I guess on the bill part. Right? When your patients get that bill, man, I'm telling you what. It's a wow moment. And I look back over that experience at the Ritz-Carlton and I say, what happened? Why did I walk around that campus all day going, wow, wow, wow? Let me tell you why. Because everybody I met had their wow factor going. You with me? Watch me. They were in the right place, doing the right job. 
that matched what they were passionate about doing. And none of it was manufactured. I mean, everybody that met me really meant what they did. Are you, are you following this? And so all weekend long, that's all I did. Wow, 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 wow. I've got a question. Wouldn't it be great if every patient that walked into your building said, wow. The only way you're ever going to change this whole scenario and become an inspirational leader is if you take a little look in the mirror every morning and be honest with the person staring back. Because you don't live for the people around you. You don't live for your community. Look at me. You don't even live for your family. You're absolutely worthless for all of them if you can't honor your who-ness. And so this is something I say to myself every morning. Every morning when I roll out of bed and I stand in front of the mirror to shave, and there's a lot to shave. I look in the mirror and I recite this poem that was written back in 1934 by a man by the name of Dale Wimbro, beautifully written and so profound and inspiring, and it's my final burst of inspiration to you. He said this, when you get what you want in your struggle for self and the world makes you king for a day, go to the mirror, look at yourself, and see what that guy has to say. For it isn't a man's mother or father or wife whose judgment upon him must pass. The person whose verdict counts most in his life is the man staring back from the glass. He's a fellow to please, never mind all the rest. For he's with you right up to the end. And you pass your most difficult, dangerous test if the guy in the glass is your friend. You can be like Jack Horner and pull out a plum and think you're a wonderful guy. But the guy in the glass thinks you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. You can fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass, but your final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the guy in the glass. God bless you. God bless you.